Okay, our next speaker is uh, Donald Prothero. His skill that he would like to have instantly, and this is a bit of a cheat, but I gave it to him because his Facebook feed is so awesome. Uh, <laughs> he would want time travel. That would be his skill. All right, I'll give it to him. Uh, the thing he would save uh, out of his burning house would be, uh, he has a copy of first edition Origin of Species. Fantastic. Uh, ninjas versus pirates, he said pirates. Okay, and cake or pie without hesitation, uh, his grandmother's pumpkin pie. His talk is called Orwell Redux, Living in a Post-Truth World. Please welcome Donald Prothero. Okay, hopefully you hear me okay out there? I'm in a lavalier mic, so, and uh, let's see, I don't have my first slide yet. Let's wait till that gets queued up here. Okay, well, let's talk about this until uh, we get it all lined up here. Um, this is a talk that sort of evolved from what I've been talking about the last couple of years. One of the books I published about a couple of years ago called Reality Check, How Science Deniers Threaten Our Future. And yes, I'll do my commercial plug too. It's on the table there in the back. If anyone wants one, I can happily sign it for you if you like as well. Um, and I thought I was done with the topic. And then political events and world events sort of overtook it. In fact, it went way beyond the most pessimistic projections I had ever thought were possible <laughs> when I wrote the book. Uh, so I, I'm sad to say the book sort of became dated just by events moving faster than I anticipated. But on the other hand, uh, in many ways I'm sort of proud of that book because it did in fact warn of, us of a lot of this stuff. And we've learned a lot of things as a result of this, uh, what's happened lately as well. Uh, so th th the problem here, of course, is we're talking about issues of science and issues of reality and how they are distinguished, and we'll probably hear more about that from Jerry later. Uh, and also the problem, of course, is that this world now is a point where science is often conflict with political reality and political situ situations where we find people who are openly denying science, which is something I talk at length about in this book, uh, both in the context of evolution, which I spent most of my life studying, and in climate change, where I've published a bit in climate change as well. So I count myself as both a climate scientist and evolutionary biologist and find myself in the same boat with all my colleagues in these fields, we're under attack right now. It's scary as shit, okay? Uh, and I'll just draw some examples of that when I get the slides up here in a moment. Uh, are you ready? Okay, go ahead. So um, the point of it is then that I never thought this was possible in my lifetime, and yet here it comes, it's really happening, and I just don't have a slideshow, do I? I still see a blank screen on your monitor. Okay, and my monitors are blank too. We'll get this figured out. Um, anyway, the, the whole idea was startling to me at first when I started thinking about this. And so I, oh yeah, I must have hit the wrong button. There we go. We're on the first slide, so now we need to go to full screen. And we're in full screen. There we go. Thank you. Um, how many guys ever read the actual 1984 high school or whatever? Show of hands. I know the room's dark now, but I wanted it that way. <laughs> even in high school, it makes an impression on you. But it makes even a bigger impression on you when you think about what's happened lately. There's my little book, sorry. I'll just get caught up here. Um, of course, Orwell wrote that book, as some of you know, in 1948, or published in 1948. Uh, and some people think he took his title just by flipping the two digits, thinking 1984 was so far in the future no one could ever imagine it. Uh, but he was basing it on what he was familiar with, which was uh, Stalin-era Soviet communism, in a world in which the government was a giant lie machine and everybody was manipulated by the government, okay? And almost everything he did in that book, of course, is an eerily prophetic in the unexpected way of, you know, essentially predicting a lot of stuff that's happened lately. And it's not coming necessarily from an all-powerful Soviet-style government, as Orwell feared, but ironically from an anti-governmental part of the country and from people who are actually not in political power but acquire it by doing so. And you all know the main theme, of one of the many main themes of the book, was how the language is distorted and truth is buried under propaganda and how a whole system becomes corrupt because nobody knows what anything means anymore and words have lost their meaning and lies are no longer lies because they're told so frequently. And so the classic uh, sort of slogan that comes out in 1984, war is peace, freedom is slavery, ignorance um, is strength, all these things of contradictions that have been turned inside out so people no longer have any understanding of what they mean. Uh, that was prophetic in ways we never thought before. And of course, some of you know that the key thing that Orwell did in that book was talk about how the government itself, in this case again, he was thinking of a Stalin-era communist government, had corrupted language to call what they called newspeak, 
And all the words had essentially acquired uh, unexpected meanings and meanings which are often contradictory to what they originally meant. And uh, weird words like crime think and thought crime and so on, where they actually tried to you know, prescribe their view of the world by changing the vocabulary. We all you know, read this book, if you read it in high school, especially, ah, oh, this is great sci-fi. <laughs> and couldn't imagine a world in which the language is so corrupted and people can't tell lies or the truth anymore that we're not, you know, we're, we don't live in Soviet uh, Russia, we don't live in the Stalin era. Now, how could that possibly happen to us, okay? And we just heard this quote in a previous talk, one of the many famous things that Orwell said, during times of universal deceit, telling the truth itself is a revolutionary act. Uh, another excellent book I recommend, uh, this is a one by a uh, reporter uh, called Farad Manju. True enough, learning to live in a post-fact society. A lot of this is now coming out more and more. And this is written a few years ago, again, before these world events that happened in the last year and a half overtook every one of us in our writing. Uh, and the idea that stuff on the news now is, is just as often false as true, and uh, you know, stuff said often enough ends up uh, being t taken as true even when it's not, and nobody bothers to fact check anymore. Okay? And now, once again, the world has caught up and actually surpassed what he thought was impossible. Uh, in fact, this is now a buzzword in the media and elsewhere. The Oxford English Dictionary now defines this term post-truth and actually has it as its word of the year for 2016, which is a pretty bad distinction. Uh, the condition in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and belief. Okay, and that's what people mean when they say post-truth. It doesn't matter whether it's true or not, it's what people believe. Okay, so that's what we're talking about here, and I'm gonna get to this. And we've seen this slowly evolve, especially in the last now 16 some years, since the inauguration of George W., that we have all these interesting things going around in the public sphere, and a lot of them concern issues which have scientific reality and have clear yes and no answers on. A lot of them are more political, but they all have similarities in the way they're treated in the media. Uh, the classic one, of course, the Bush administration pushed about the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. We've now known that was no longer true. Uh, or going back to one of the oldest ones, from the Holocaust deniers ever since World War II, that the Holocaust never happened, okay? Uh, the one that the, the cigar, cigarette companies pushed for many years, that smoking's not bad for you, or at least it's not clear that it is. You know, that's how they managed to stay unregulated for 50 years. Uh, the one that I deal with as much, uh, climate change isn't real, or where it's not our fault if it is, or evolution's just a theory. These are the ones that are my lifestyle. And uh, another kind of common example, science denialism, uh, vaccines don't, uh, vaccines cause autism. These are all lies we see running around society. It's a startling number of people believe a good percentage of the wrong answers on these. Uh, a very famous book in 2010 you might have read, uh, Naomi Reskes and Eric Conway wrote, uh, uh, called uh, The Merchants of Doubt. To a great degree, why this confusion in the public exists is not accidental. It's very much deliberate. It's very much a product, part of the process of propaganda and of uh, uh, merchandising and public relations of spreading lies, or in this case, as they point out, what they do when they don't have science on their side is create doubt by creating a big smoke screen of fake studies and PR studies and various other types of lobbying efforts to basically keep the public from really having a clear opinion. And this comes all the way back to the 1950s when a famous PR firm, Hill and Knowlton, was being consulted by R.G. Reynolds and other big tobacco companies. And the tobacco companies back in the 50s knew their product was deadly. And they were realizing that along down the line, eventually the people would start realizing it was deadly. And so they had the PR firm, Hill and Knowlton, go through a, a strategy how to cope with this and keep their business model alive. And the most famous quote, which is of course the source of the title here, uh, came from that memo is, doubt is our product. Okay, not tobacco, doubt is our product. So this is the best means of competing with a body of fact that exists in the minds of the general public. It also means establishing controversy. And this whole book reviews how almost every large scientific controversy that has a clear case of science says one thing and the public believes something else is usually actually manufactured by either tobacco companies or energy companies or whatever that have deliberately tried to create a smoke screen, and that's a nice double entendre right there, to complete our uh, illusions about what's going on. So we find ourselves in a situation where lots of people find it profitable or at least politically expedient to deny reality. Uh, and we're in a situation where we're going to find a lot of their, there are a lot of powerful interests, a lot of money behind people who can find a way to deny the inconvenient truths. I mean, the choice of Al Gore's title was a very good one. It's inconvenient truths are often scary to people and that people want to make sure they aren't taken seriously. 
as we said, tobacco companies created doubt for about 50 years, but as some of you who are old enough to remember this, right around 99 or so, they were finally called out on the floor of Congress. They had to use the RICO Act. It was used originally to design to break down organized crime. You get the tobacco company executives on the floor of Congress basically perjuring themselves and uh, denying that they, in fact, had created this smoke screen of doubt all this time. Um, again, Bush and Cheney, uh, and Cheney still, to this day, denies that we didn't find weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. They were there, or they, you know, somehow we didn't uh, publicize it properly, and there's a lot of people who still believe him. Uh, the most recent revelation of how these smoke screens work, is if you pay attention to the news the last year and a half, for years we've known from a lot of leaked memos and so on that ExxonMobil, Koch brothers, and so others have deliberately spent a lot of money to you know, create this denial of climate and this doubt about climate change. Finally, enough paperwork came out, especially out of ExxonMobil files. ExxonMobil is now under investigation by multiple state attorneys generals. And there's one just got a case now approved for trial just last week. And they are going to be under trial for conspiracy. And the paper trail is very clear. Uh, in fact, they've actually had to backtrack and admit they did it, which is a great irony considering the man most responsible for it is now being considered as our Secretary of State. Okay? So it's a very strange world we have that this kind of power to deny truth can be so powerful. And so when you, when you see, for example, we talk about climate change, and people say, oh, scientists are in a great conspiracy. You know, 97% of the world's scientists could try an environmental crisis but exposed by a plucky band of billionaires and oil companies. <laughs> and as you see, that how, just how implausible it is. It's, I mean, I won't go into lengths about this, but in a version of the lecture I gave, I talk about how we, scientists never get to agree, agree unless you have an overwhelming body of evidence. And they're very hard to get them to even agree at a faculty meeting, let alone on something that large. <laughs> Conspiracy is about the last thing you can get scientists to do. But you sure can get it with oil companies. So we ended up in the late part of the last decade, right after the Bush administration, this weird world uh, that Karl Rove, more than anyone else, created. A uh, famous quote he said during the peak of the Iraq war uh, sort of confusion. That's not the way the real world really works anymore. We're an empire now. And we create, when we act, we create our own reality. Very striking for a choice of phrases. So here he is arguing with Plato. But surely agrees, talking to Plato, that truth can be created by the repetition of a lie. Okay, that is just how startling this is, you know, that they're so confident in their political power at that time when they were pushing the Iraq war that they basically said, we create our own reality. Um, and so I took issue with this in the original book, which is when I was inspired to write it, that we create our own reality. I and mean, as a scientist, we don't have that option. Okay, as a scientist, we know there are things that are real and are not. And I just put in a bunch of famous quotes which say it beautifully from Philip K. Dick, a famous science fiction author, most of you know, reality is that which, when you stop believing in it, doesn't go away. <laughs> Aldous Huxley, facts do not cease to exist, exist because they are ignored. And Thomas Sowell, famous economist, for every expert there's an equal and opposite expert, for every fact there's not necessarily an equal and opposite fact. Uh, from Daniel Patrick Moynihan, a very excellent senator, you're entitled to your own opinions, but you're not entitled to your own facts. Okay, there are things that are independent of us outside, I hope there. And then one of my favorites, Bill Maher, what's real is real and like it or not, no one can change the nature of reality except, of course, with mushrooms. <laughs> but yet we are in this world where PR by, by the oil companies and their, their internal travelers has generated this giant confusion where, as, as a climate scientist, I know this from personal experience, and of course, the survey after survey shows it, there's almost no doubt among my fellow climate scientists that humans are the cause of climate change, and it's happening. It's actually, we find it happening faster and faster, and so on. So on the left-hand side there, you see the percentage of acceptance of climate change. You can't read all the details, but the higher the percentage, the closer they are to the data. The people who have less access to data, who are not really climate scientists, have the greatest amount of doubt. Uh, it's a better shown than a classic pie chart here. Not my grandmother's pumpkin pie, but nonetheless a pie chart. Uh, the one on the upper left there has 33,700 authored peer-reviewed articles on climate change. Only 34 out of the 33,000, right? So that's one in a thousand, roughly, are in denial of this in the public review of the literature. When Naomi Ressis first did this in 19, uh, 2000, she used 980 articles out of Science, one of the top journals in the world. 980 is zero in, in that form. Uh, and yet, the bottom pie chart goes, there's the famous study that says 97% of climate scientists accept that climate change is real and humans cause it. And yet, 
55% of the public in America doesn't believe it's real. And that number fluctuates depending on how the survey goes. Right after, for example, the 2012 election and uh, Hurricane Sandy happened, a weather event, which is not a climate event, there are different things, but a weather event, Sandy, made Americans up to about 75% accepting climate change. So it's, it's a weird figure. It fluctuates a bit. Uh, this is a, my, one of my favorite clips. I've had enough time to play it. I would play it. Uh, some of you guys watch HBO and John Oliver's show. It's one of my favorites. I never miss one. He's brilliant in so many levels. And he did a very famous episode, which I always play for my class whenever I talk about climate change, where he talks about this mismatch between the public's perception of this and the actual scientific evidence, the scientific consensus about it, and saying, well, 55% of Americans think climate change didn't happen or isn't happening. And uh, his reply in the video is, don't, who gives a shit? You don't need people's opinion on a fact. You might as well have a poll asking which number is bigger, 15 or 5? Or do owls exist? Or are there hats? <laughs> right? That's it. Opinion polls don't determine scientific fact, and yet that's how the media treats it. The debate on climate change ought not to be whether it exists, it should be what, what to do about it. There's a mountain of research on the topic, and that's where the rest of the clip goes on. And the end of the clip is brilliant. Uh, he talks about how the media always split it 50-50. They love to have a false controversy when there is none. And so they'll have some person denying climate change versus my friend Bill Nye. And so what happens is he brings Bill Nye in and a climate change denier who's actually an actor. And says, okay, to have a statistically representative debate on this topic, we need to actually have 96 other climate scientists and two other deniers. And then they get on the stage and have all these extras that were called in the last minute before they filmed, all wearing white lab coats, crowding the stage all around the, the, the podium. And uh, they start the debate, and then it gets into a shouting match, and then Oliver closes the segment. We should never have had this debate in the first place, but this is how unrepresented the media present it. It's always a 50-50 thing, even though it's not actually that way in reality. So we are now in a world I never thought possible. Yeah, this is all over Facebook. I couldn't resist it. Uh, a world I never thought possible, for those of you a fan of the old Rod Serling series, this is a Twilight Zone. I'm sorry if I step on some political toes here, but this is very much a scientific issue as much as a political issue. We never thought it possible that we'd be in a situation where people who are openly in defiance of all the scientific evidence, uh, climate change being the highest order here, but we'll talk about evolution briefly, and Jeannie will talk more about it in a moment, and also things like, uh, even anti-vaxxing is now getting on the agenda of the Trump administration. Um, and what's interesting about this is this whole thing of, why did this all happen? Why do we have somebody who is so manifestly uh, against science and against a lot of reality in charge of this thing? And as many of you have probably heard, it's the usual response of Trump voters is say, oh, we wanted someone who wasn't part of the system, who shake things up, who, you know, not, not an insider in Washington. And so I love this little uh, uh, cartoon here that says it beautifully. Uh, the man is standing up on an airplane holding up his hand saying, these smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly this plane? And it says it beautifully in a nutshell. Let's let the amateurs run the show for a while. Well, four years of this, we'll see what happens. All right. So we have now this Orwellian situation, I thought never possible, where the lie and the truth are really hard to tell in the public, where a great percentage of the public doesn't know that it's lying, or if they do know, they don't care. Okay. And so this, uh, uh, we were talking about political cartoons last time, and this uh, says it so beautifully. Here he has this uncritical media as his megaphone for lie after lie after lie, and we'll get to that topic as well. All right? Uh, yes, I try to be fair on political spectrums, but here is pretty much a clear-cut yes or no answer. Uh, certainly there are politicians who lie. Certainly Hillary Clinton never uh, got by without telling no untruths. But you take any of those impartial groups that try to test the hypothesis of who lies more, PolitiFact and all these various other things. Uh, you know, most of the statements that Hillary Clinton said during the campaign were true or close to true. There are only a couple that are in like 13% that are in that lower category. Most of what Trump said was out and out false, either knowingly false or just misdeluding false. Uh, depends on how you phrase the, the survey, but it's 50 to 70 to 90% of what he said was simply not true, okay? And an objective the truth in that situation. And that's ironically how he won. He told the public what they wanted to hear. Okay, and so there's his path to 270, 270 lies, one after another after another. And some of you are going to hear this term a lot now. This has come out of the blue as a term that not a lot of people use before, but it's now I think going to become very popular. It's a phrase called gaslighting. How a sociopath or someone who wants to manipulate people really doesn't care what's true anymore. 
They just continually ratchet up the, 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 the untruths until they basically get the result they like. And it comes actually from an old play in the 1930s, which was then made into a movie with Ingrid Bergman in the 1940s called Gaslight. And the plot of the play is that the husband, who's trying to drive the wife crazy, keeps on tinkering with the environment, like turning the lights down, there are gas lights in this play, and doing all sorts of things to change the environment, they're pretending nothing happened. So she begins to doubt her sanity, because things are keep changing and she can't explain why. And that's really what this is about. You constantly go about in this process of, of uh, creating doubt about what's real, and making the manipulating situation so the public really can't tell what's fake and what's real anymore, and then they're basically suckers for whatever you tell them. All right, and the, the line of evidence for this and the quotes for this just go on and on and on. We just keep getting new examples every few weeks here. This is from a few weeks ago on CNN, one of Trump's spokesmen, Scott Neil Hughes, said this, there's no such thing, unfortunately, anymore as facts. I never thought I'd have to read, my, read that quote. Mr. Trump's tweet amounts to a certain crowd. A large part of the population are truth, right? They don't care. They just, they're truth because Trump said them. When he said that millions of voters illegally voted, people believe he has the facts to back it up. Those who do not like Mr. Trump say those facts are lies and there's no way to back it up. If you say that facts are facts, they're not really facts. Everybody has a way. It's a kind of looking at the ratings or looking at glass half full of water. Everyone has a way of interpreting to be true or not true. I mean, I, if you think about what, how a philosopher's brain must be going upside down and just reading something like that, it's just scary as hell. All right, and the really striking thing about the kinds of lies that dominated his political campaign was that they were very easily falsified, but they were also very powerful, that they were magical thinking. They were telling people what they wanted to hear, classic manipulation that dictators and sociopaths do all the time, and yet anyone who knows a little bit about politics, a little bit about economics, a little bit about geology, in my case, can tell you right away that it's a fat out lie that they were talking about. So I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, he, he basically manipulated the states which are heavy in coal, and Ohio was one of those. He won for that reason, uh, by talking about bringing back coal to the Appalachian region. And anybody in economics and anybody in coal geology, which I've actually taught once in a while, could tell you that's not possible. American coal is gone for good. Not because of government interference, because of capitalism. Okay? American coal is gone because thanks to the dropping price of natural gas and the dropping price of solar energy, it's too expensive to mine and it's not worth taking out of the ground anymore. It will never come back because those other resources will continue to becoming more and more part of our energy portfolio. There's no reason on earth to think we'd ever want to go back to coal, which is not only expensive, which will have killed it, but it's also environmentally the worst of all the polluters. Okay? Peabody Energy, largest coal company in the, plant, uh, in the world at the time, is now out of business. Okay? It'll be gone from the United States virtually all across the country in not too long. It's gone in almost all the rest of the parts of the world that used to have coal, except for China. China's still dealing with it, but they were on the plan to phase it out. Okay? Uh, he made a lot of promises in the states he won, like Ohio and like uh, Michigan and like uh, Pennsylvania, of bringing out their Rust Belt jobs. Right? old-fashioned manufacturing on a large scale. Anyone in economics or anyone who knows the, how the situation works will tell you that's just bullshitting, okay? Not gonna happen. Why? Rust Belt jobs used to be guaranteed by unions, which used to support Democrats and don't have much power anymore, and those jobs are all based on a cost of living that no business wants to keep up with. Unless you're willing to work for about a, less than a dollar an hour, and uh, work slave labor wages like they will in China and they will in much of the underdeveloped world, you're never gonna bring those jobs back. And then even more so now, anything that can be automated will be automated. So talking about bringing back steel and bringing back all these other things like coal, it's just bullshitting, okay? And yet he did it and did it over and over again. And of course, he was really appealing to an audience that really wants to bring back the magic of the 1950s, you know? The white Christian America, when minorities and women and so on were uh, closeted, out of the way, barefoot and pregnant in the case of women, right? Very interesting survey the Kaiser Foundation did during the election about the health care issue, right? And how people were unhappy with their Obamacare, which many of them don't realize is the same as ACA, which they like, okay? <laughs> That's how propaganda works. You label it and then people don't understand things. And the voters who had, uh, for Trump who were in those states like Ohio and Pennsylvania, Michigan and so on, so they wanted full health care coverage for themselves and their families. They don't care if others don't have health care. They don't want to pay for it. They don't want to pay health care insurance. And they don't want the government involved. 
So what are you going to do? Uh, who's going to pay for it? I mean, this is the kind of magical thing we're dealing with, right? They want everything, and they don't want to do anything. Uh, and so you saw all these quotes during the election cycle of things like, well, I don't want the government to mess around with my Medicare. <laughs> no, that really, you know, even though the check comes United States Treasury and they cash it, right, they don't they seem to connect that Medicare is actually something they pay for in their tax package and they get back, just like Social Security, all of which are threatened to be gutted in the next few weeks. So we have the so-called Trump Tower of Promises, which is huge, as Trump would say it. And we have several problems. The number one problem, of course, is journalism is all now about not you know, trying to tell the truth to the public. That's gone. It's about making money and appealing to audiences. And whatever gets viewers gets played. And so Trump managed to play them. Because he's a, if there's nothing else he is, he's a great TV star. Okay? He knows how to play the music and do the song dance that the media love. And that's how he got by with the kind of campaign he ran. He basically didn't have to do a traditional campaign. Uh, and as, again, Orwell says, journalism is a printing what someone else does not want printed. Everything else is public relations. Uh, and a good journalist is out there to try to debunk and try to shoot down. And that is disappearing in a large fashion. Uh, just quickly to remind you what Trump promised and what he's already done since the time the election ended. Uh, he made loads and loads of promises, which every one of us who knows the story heard about and asked what the hell is he talking about. Uh, draining the swamp, okay? Promised to get rid of all the Washington insiders and billionaires. And as all you know, what is his cabinet made of? Washington insiders and billionaires, okay? Build the wall. Uh, lately, he's been hedging and hedging and hedging on this. And of course, he's got to have the Congress to actually spend the money on it, which they're not big on spending any kind of money, so we'll see what happens. Uh, repeal Obamacare, we don't know what's going to happen. Apparently, the House and Senate have all voted, but what would come out of reconciliation is a question. And then, of course, whether they're going to get rid of the popular provisions or not, it's hard to know, because they're going to get some backlash before this is all said and done. We already talked about bringing back coal, uh, mass deportation of every illegal immigrant in the country. Now, the only thing you'll hear them talking about is just illegals who are, have criminal records. Uh, scrap their Rand deal, he's backed off on that. Locking up Hillary, he's backed off on that. Um, it played well at the time, but nah, I didn't mean it. That's basically what it amounts to. Um, for time reasons, I won't play this little clip here, but if you want to do it, it's very nice. Uh, Trevor Moa has been interesting as a replacement for Jon Stewart here. And this is a very interesting clip he, pl uh, he put up a couple weeks ago. So this type Trevor Noah, uh, Trump backtrack or Trump promises. He basically plays a bunch of clips from Trump's post-victory tour that he did, right, where he went back to the same audience as he went to before the election. And in every clip, he basically says, oh, I really didn't mean that, or this sounded good at the time, but you know, you know, we really don't want to think we're going to do that. He basically has reneged on most of what he told those same people six months ago, and the audience is cheering. Uh, and then Noah says, what? And, uh, he says, it's comparable to a magician telling you how the trick works, and the audience is still convinced the magic is real. Okay, that's how bizarre this is. Okay, so anyway, type, you know, Google search, uh, you know, t uh, Trevor Noah and uh, Trump promises—a very clever little thing that you might want to watch. So, just a couple of headlines here to show these various types of promises he backtracked on, uh, including uh, things that uh, Breitbart is actually giving him a hard time for Brett backpedaling on, even though they were his biggest back. So you say to yourself, "What the heck happened here?" How did it come to this? Okay, Even I couldn't have imagined this, and I was very pessimistic in that book I wrote a couple years ago, that we'd ever get to the point where we could get this far off rails. And so I'm going to be a nostalgic old boomer here and indulge myself a little bit of the misty past. And the times are good. America was great again when I was growing up. And remind you that it always wasn't this way. Uh, most of you young enough now, or in this room are too young to remember this, but there are some who do. It's a very different world. If you looked at the media in the 60s, 70s, pretty much into the 80s, uh, pretty much between 1949 and 87, we had a, something called the Fairness Doctrine. Some of you may have heard about this. Okay, At the time, it put restrictions on the media as to what they could do in the news. And at this time, by the way, news divisions were not profit-making machines, and many of them were actually loss leaders. Like CBS News prided itself on losing money on news in order to be factually correct and to be uh, the, on top of things. And, but the, what they had in the Ferris Doctrine was a thing where you had to be careful about the opinionation, about editorializing, about to, straying too far from anything, very strict fact-checking regulations. All this stuff was detailed. 
And all of those newscasters that my generation grew up with, like Dear Oliver Walter, and uh, for a generation older than mine, Edward R. Murrow, probably the pioneer of this, and then Hunt, Chet Huntley and uh, David Brinkley and others as well. Uh, they were very middle of the road, except if you were an extreme right winger and then they seemed liberal. Okay? But they really had to appeal to the broadest audience. There was only four channels. Right? And most of us can't imagine that anymore, right? There were only four channels on which three gave news. Okay? This is before almost all the other channels are familiar with. And then Fairness Doctrine was thrown out during the Reagan years because of a good reason. There were some very powerful people behind the Reagan administration who wanted to get rid of this attempt to be in the middle of the road. And so in 1996, a few years after Fairness Doctrine was obliterated, Rupert Murdoch, talk about the evil empire, Rupert Murdoch. Uh, decided it was time to have his own network, and of course he's rich enough and powerful enough to buy one and make it his own, and he did with Fox. Then bothered Roger Daly's, who had been an advisor to three Republican presidents, Reagan, Bush, and Nixon, and said, okay, we're going to have a right-wing broadcast network. It's going to be nothing but right-wing point of view. It was very clear from the very beginning. There's documents left and right that show this is what they chose to do. They were going to completely cover over the uh, type of thing, and so they became the so-called Fair and balanced, and no irony intended by them, of course. Fair and balanced type of network. And a couple of years after they went into existence here, they went to, there was a court case, and Fox News was given the right under the First Amendment to tell a lie. And so here's the, four, the decision on the court case here. Florida Court Appeals case that decided that there was no obligation under any of the statutes there that they actually had to tell you the truth on the news. Um, and so here we have in the bottom right corner there, uh, the guy is pointing to the, the thing after this kind of thing is announced. He says, to protect ourselves against truth and advertising claims, the legal department proposed a following adju uh, uh, adjustment on our logo. And so Fox News is under quotes there. And the Ailey's himself has a famous quote saying, the truth is whatever people will believe. I just, again, it's hard for me to believe this is, this is out in the public. So let me play a couple of little memes here that say this beautifully. Um, <laughs> There's uh, your brain, there's your brain on Fox News. I don't watch Fox News the same reason I don't eat out of a toilet. Um, the startling thing is, it's been style studied quite a bit what happens when people watch nonstop propaganda from the right wing on Fox News, is that they are given a totally different world viewpoint. And all you have to do is do a survey, and you find out that Fox News viewers not only don't know much about the world, they actually know less about the world than people who don't watch the news at all. Okay, because they've got so much in the way of false information that's embedded in them from years of doing this. And so just on the right column there is a, an example of one of these surveys, and there's a citation there on the upper left. Uh, they still believe that the economy got worse under Obama, okay, although it's all, all objective measures it got better. Uh, most of them, a high percentage, 30% are climate deniers. They believe their income taxes have gone up. That's objectively not true. Uh, they believe this Obama stimulus did not work. That's objectively not true. Uh, they believe that Obamacare worse than the deficit actually made it better because it cut health care costs for a while. Uh, as you know, Trump got his start in this whole thing by being a birther. And there's still a lot of birthers out there. They were his first audience, right, that Obama was not born in this country. Uh, all right, or that he's a secret Muslim. Again, a very high percentage, a scary percentage of people believe these. And most recently, this is not in that survey, but another this survey just came out, 32% of Fox News viewers think he won the popular vote even though he lost it by th almost three million. All right? They're basically living in a totally different reality from the rest of us, and it's very scary. Okay? So here's an actual graphic that shows what employment did under Obama, and of course it went down from the mess that George W. left us in. And yet there's what Fox News viewers see on the thing to the left, they think it went increased by 67% to 20%. They have a diametrically opposite of reality viewpoint on many, many issues. Uh, Bill Maher did a famous thing on this, and now this is talked about this is a bubble. We're all in a bubble to some degree. I mean, I admit, you know, I read mostly left-wing sources, and I'm in my own bubble. I'm sure I don't hear everything that's out there. But this is one case where the, you know, the clear-cut cases of stuff that's real, stuff that's documented by objective sources, just simply don't get through the Fox News bubble. So this little cartoon has them in a Macy's parade here with the Fox News viewers inside the bubble, and then behind it, the Benghazi scandal is falling apart, and it says, they're the only ones who don't know the balloon behind them popped. Or again, I love this. Uh, we had an editorial cartoon uh, panel yesterday because that was, was so powerful in this case. The first one in the upper left there says the Fox News uh, announcer saying, the earth is flat. We have a Breitbart video clip from Kansas to prove it. <laughs> and the, the bottom one there is the Fox News truck 
and the slogan on the side says, comforting the comfortable, afflicting the afflicted. Okay? Uh, so in North Korea, people are forced to listen to propaganda. In the U.S., they do it willingly. So we have a very different media world than before the Fair Defenders Doctrine was revoked, okay? A media world that's not only fragmented in terms of television networks, which is one thing, it's fragmented across the whole media spectrum. So I admit, I mostly watch and read websites that have a liberal bias. I will admit that, but there are lots of people you might know who do the opposite. This is a cute little cartoon here that shows sort of the standing, whether it's center, left, or right, of most of the media. And you see a bunch of familiar media like NPR and BBC, more or less dead center, as, as unbiased as they come. And then uh, you show the left there, you see Huffington Post, and then the crazy sites like Natural News in the lower left. And then off to right of center, to the extreme right of center, of course, is Fox News. And then the bottom there is Infowars and Breitbart and, uh, tr and so on. Okay? And here's Breitbart now with the most powerful media influence of the Trump's administration. They're the most extreme uh, uh, crackpot of group. So again, so cartoons, again, say it beautifully. I just can't uh, beat them in that respect here. Um, here is a typical debate in this situation. So one guy says, Obama's a socialist in the grip of Wall Street. He's a weak on defense, but escalated the Afghan war, soft immigration. He deported record numbers. He raised my taxes, actually cut them. Why are you so grossly misinformed? Because Obama's a lousy communicator. <laughs> so we've gone a very, very long way from President 1 to President 45. I cannot tell a lie. Then Richard Nixon, I cannot tell the truth. And then I cannot tell the difference, OK? Uh, famous scholar of the Holocaust, Hannah Arendt, said this very nicely. The ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or the dedicated communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction, truth and false, no longer exists. That's how scary this world we're in right now. Okay? And of course, it's not a new phenomenon. Okay? I mean, Stalin was a master of it, and his propaganda minister was, but probably the most famous of these, of course, is probably the man who invented modern media propaganda, uh, uh, Joseph Goebbels, as Hitler's propaganda minister. If you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. And now we are actually watching this in real time in a way I never thought possible. Or this version of it, if you repeat a lie often enough, it becomes not truth, but politics. So let's step back a bit before we get to that point and wrap this up and say, OK, where did this come from? And why are people so easily manipulated? We talked about some of the external causes. But one of the things I tried to do in that book that I published a few years ago, Reality Check, was talk about what goes on in the mind of science denier, persons who deny reality. What motivates people to think, think this way? And you think we know a lot of answers there, but the surprising things that go on in the mind of deniers of science and now of all, all sorts of reality. It's a very common thing. Humans are very good at denying reality. Okay? Uh, psychologists have identified this a long time ago. It's now given a general rubric of motivated reasoning. And there are many familiar examples of this we'll talk about in a moment, all of them under this uh, general rubric. And it actually goes back a long way. We you know, never have been otherwise. But back in the Enlightenment, the great Marquis de Condorcet, a very famous figure in philosophy, thought at that time in the late 1700s in France that we were at an age of enlightenment, that we would eventually have rationality making all decisions for human beings. And uh, Marquis himself falsified that because he was beheaded on the guillotine by the terror. Okay? We are not rational machines. We're emotional machines, or Michael Shermer calls it belief engines, or uh, believing beings. We have a core belief, our worldview, which often we're not even conscious of. We inherit it usually from our families, from people around us. And all of us, and I, we are all feel guilty of this, you have to try to screen against it as much as you can, but it's not easy, are always in a situation where we have to be careful because our minds want to do whatever it takes to deny or to twist or to ignore any evidence that threatens its core beliefs. It's very hard for humans to do that because we are very much <coughs> belief engines or belief machines. We would love to hear a reassuring lie and not an inconvenient truth. Okay. Very good, well-chosen title, because it is, in fact, the way things work. Okay? Um, some of you know about the mechanisms that where this works. The psychologists have identified them. The biggest one is so-called re uh, uh, reduction of cognitive dissonance, that you have in your mind two or more ideas which may not mesh very well, or you may actually directly contradict one another, and yet you have to live with yourself. So you tell yourself, I'm a moral person, but yes, you break the speed limit. Yes, you may you know, under-tip your server. 
You may do things that you know are not really right, but you still believe you're a moral person. Okay? We all do this. It's impossible not to. Okay? And we find a way to reconcile, to dismiss, to accommodate these conflicts in the various parts of our mind that say, well, I'm moral, but yes, I did speed yesterday and I did break the law. Okay? The other major thing that dominates this kind of thinking is tribalism. We're all products of where we were raised. And Seth's comments in his, uh, his talk was very apropos. You grow up in a religious family, unless you do like Seth did and break away from it, you're never going to see anything else. And we're all products of where we were, okay? And especially, as we'll talk about in a moment, you grow up, say, like my wife did in a small town in southeast Kansas. The second question they ask you after they ask your name is, what church do you go to? Right? You've all probably heard this. You can't live in that community if you don't identify with something they consider legitimate. It's very hard to be a black sheep in small town America. Which is why they voted so much for Trump in many ways. Okay, so let's talk about cognitive dissonance a little bit more here. Uh, this is Stan Arndt's definition of it. Sometimes people hold a core belief that's very strong. When they're presented with evidence that works against that belief, new evidence cannot be accepted. It'll create a feeling that's uncomfortable. That's the dissonance part of it, right? And because it's so important to predict that core belief, they'll rationalize, ignore, even deny anything that doesn't fit with their core belief. Okay? Um, I love this little set of quotes here. F. Scott Fitzgerald, who had his own mental issues late in life, uh, said, the test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function, which, of course, Fitzgerald had his issues with. In reality, all of us are like that. Okay? We don't have to be first-rate intelligence. We're always wrestling with these contradictions in our brain. Okay? And then this is a quote from a British reporter who was interviewing one of these so-called scientists at Ken Ham's little institution. Watching creationist Jason Lyle try to reconcile the cutting edge of modern planetary physics with the offhand assertions of a religious tract written thousands of years ago by an unknown assortment of semi-bearded cave dwellers, I found myself wondering how long this poor chap has. Not to overdo the Fitzgerald, but I shall think of this creationist uh, often as day after day they beat on, vote against the current of your truth, born back and ceaselessly into being completely, utterly wrong. Very, very interesting way that this kind of thing operates. So there is classic case of cognitive dissonance, right? Let's say you're a smoker and you know the evidence against smoking, right? So smoking cigarettes is unhealthy, but I'm a smoker, right? You're a nick addict, basically, okay? Two possible solutions, right? You don't smoke anymore, you kick the habit. Or, what cognitive dissonance usually does says, well, the research is inconclusive. I could keep on smoking. That's the way you get around it. You find a way to weasel out of what you know to be true. Or in the case of climate change denial, the usual motivator there, the deeply held belief, the, the, the core belief of people who are climate deniers, is all about hardcore capitalism, often hardcore libertarian capitalism. Global warming constrains business, and anything that constrains business is bad. Government is bad. Anything is bad that constrains business, because I believe in unrestrained capitalism. Therefore, the science must be wrong. Right? That's where this kind of loop comes from. So yes, it's a very interesting thing. We talked about ostriches sticking their heads in the sand <laughs> yesterday, and here we have our ostrich a little overcooked because he did his head in the sand too long. Now, I must admit, it's a little hard to be nonpartisan on this issue. Yes, there are things that Democrats and liberals do hold that are not so scientific. GMOs are one. There's some others as well. But unfortunately, when this kind of issue comes up to the big issues, the biggest being climate change and then evolution and some other ones, it's unfortunately very one-sided, right? We have a Congress now run entirely by science deniers and all the science committees. So the House Science Committee is all people who deny climate change, and most of them are also creationists. They're in charge of our science funding. And if you watch the spectacle on Capitol Hill the last few years, every time they held a hearing, they tried to bring these various lobbyists from the, the petroleum institutes up to tell them what they want to hear, and then crucify, crucify the ones that the Democrats brought up who are actual scientists and know what they're talking about. And it's scary, and it's all, as you know, it's follow the money, just like Deep Throat said. It's because most of them are paid for, lock, lock, stock, and barrel by energy companies, especially Koch Brothers and Exxon Mobil. Okay? So it's a false equivalent to say, oh, well, both sides have woo, both sides have non-scientific beliefs. That's true to a limited extent, but the real crucial issue is not how much, uh, say, left-wingers are in favor of GMOs or against GMOs or whatever. It's on the key issues, the ones that really are societal-wide and climate that would be global-wide, 
There's only one party that's adopted a completely anti-science pro program when it comes to climate change and uh, evolution as well. Only one group of people that have pushed creations in public schools that's not Democrats. Um, turns out even anti-vaxxers are more common on the right than the left when you actually do the surveys. Okay? There are more of them there than you think there are. Uh, and the most important distinction, why this is not a fairly equivalent situation, yes, there are people who have weird ideas on the left, in the Democratic Party, but they're not dictating policy. Whereas the right wing is dominated by people who are dictating policy, an official plank of the Republican Party, and now of our incoming president next Friday, is science denial. That's where it gets scary. So, as I said, Congress has these very weird hearings. There's a very clever one that John Stewart did back when he was still doing The Daily Show, where he shows all his climate deniers roasting government scientist John Holdren, who's brilliant and t tears them to pieces. And the whole committee, the majority committee, of course, because it was run by Republicans, is all climate deniers and creationists. These are the people in charge of our science funding and the direction of science. And I'll show you how scary that can be in the long run. All right. Um, so we get these weird statements. Uh, here's our, one of our chief bugaboos, a statement from a guy who was uh, Seth Andrews' senator. I'm sure Seth would love to disavow him. Here's uh, James Inhofe, the three biggest climate denier in Congress. The reason I'm not impressed with science and scientists is because the Lord Almighty can overcome those so-called facts in the blink of an eye. That's the kind of thinking we're dealing with. Okay? So we have like one climate denier denying all that evidence here, and yet they have more power than the 97, 98% of scientists and the commentary there either is that dense or he doesn't believe in gravity either. <laughs> and again, the other aspect of it again is tribalism. You grow up with your community, with your family, with the people around you, and especially if you don't leave that community like rural Trump voters don't very often, you become part of that. It's very hard for you to learn anything else, okay? Science appeals to our rational brains, but our beliefs are dictated by emotion, and the biggest motivator is being tight with your peers. And then Marsha McNutt, a very brilliant geophysicist who was head of AGU a couple of years ago, she says, we're all in high school still. We never left. People have a need to fit in. That need fit in so strong, local values and local opinions always trump science. And this is before the word Trump had a double meaning. They will continue to trump science, especially when there's no clear downside to ignoring science, right? They don't really care. So we are in a really scary situation where we have to look, worry about these scientific realities being pushed back by uh, misleading things and rejection, denial, suppression. I'll let Jerry talk about this at greater length at the end here, but let me just do my short version of it. Why do we scientists have the arrogance to say that we might have a little better access to truth? Is there some reason why we should not be taken more seriously or less seriously? Um, the biggest thing is that science is about testing hypotheses, it's about shooting data wrong, falsification of hypotheses, replacing them with better ones. It's not about final truth. You never say we believe in gravity. We believe in evolution. We accept it because of evidence. Okay, that's how it works. And the most important thing, which the public largely doesn't get because they've never been in this position, as a scientist, everything I write that I submit to a journal goes to peer review. And I say peer review and the people don't have a clue what I'm talking about. It's more than just fact checking. Your worst enemy can anonymously read your paper and do anything they want to it and you cannot stop it. The journal editor is the only referee. So you have to have really good evidence to get it in print in the first place. Then, after it made it to print with maybe three or four referees, there's another several years of vetting by everybody who has a reason to shoot you down. That's the most rigorous way of fact-checking and truth-checking we have in all of society. All right, so again, here's my good friend Neil here. When different experiments give you the same results, no longer subject to your opinion. That's the good thing about science. It's true whether or not believe in it. That's why it works. All right, or again, my favorite, Carl Sagan here, at the heart of science is essential balance between two seemingly contradictory attitudes. Openness, new ideas, no matter how bizarre or uh, 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 counterintuitive they may be, and the most ruthless, skeptical scrutiny of all the ideas, old and new. This is how deep truths are winnowed from deep nonsense. All right? Now that speaks for itself there. Science, the cure to bullshit. So why do we have this weird attitude towards science? You know, we love science when it gives us better health. All these gizmos on the podium here are all thanks to science, right? We all have this attitude, science does these things for us and we love it there. We're all alive probably now because science has reduced the death rate of children in the, all of our part of the world, not so much in the underdeveloped part of the world. But anytime science tells us an inconvenient truth like creationism is not real or climate is changing, we reject it. 
You know, we can't have it all the way, apparently. We have to have it only what we like. Um, and it's almost always ideology behind that. And I would argue to you, because of the system of peer review, and especially because the scientific community is not motivated by PR. It shouldn't be. It's, sometimes there are exceptions. But the scientific community is motivated by trying to find the answer, by trying to establish what the data are and then solve it. We don't really care how the answer goes. Okay? And we aren't, na by nature, spoil sports, you know, bad, you know, bad sports. We don't necessarily want to make you feel bad. There is no upside to us being bad, uh, telling you bad news. Okay? What the data says is what the data says. And if it's bad news, we have an obligation to tell it to you just as if it's good news. We'd rather give you good news if we could, but if a scientist is telling you something is probably bad or probably going to happen you don't like to hear, there's no reason for them to lie. We'd never get more grant funding for it. We don't get more publicity generally for it. Good news travels better than bad news. Okay? Um, Let's see, for time reasons, I'll skip this card. Oh, no, this is worth going to it. Boy, science is incredible. Saved my family, and aunt got an artificial heart. My cousin had his cancer cured. I'm so thankful. Well, you know, one of the reasons we've been studying human evolution. Whoa, evolution? You guys have no idea what you're talking about, idiots. Sure love my new phone, all this technology, do whatever I want, whatever I do. That's funding for NASA, so important. Well, NASA, we're going to wait more tax dollars to spate. I hear they found more oil, thousands of feet under the ocean. Boy, science can do anything these days. Find that oil, get it out, run my truck, my house, amazing. Yes, but unfortunately, global warming, hey, shut up with those lies, you damn dirty Swiss scientists. I don't trust your kind. This is a very strange schizophrenia that we have here with science. Uh, this cartoon, I love this one, this I've used a lot, uh, shows Archimedes there in the upper left. He's the, the most brilliant man on the planet in the fifth century BC, third century BC, drawing his circles, and the Roman soldiers took Syracuse and had instructions to take him alive because he was... Very valuable when he made siege engines and Greek fire, and they cut his head off because they didn't know who he was. Okay, don't disturb my circles, then he dies. Or there's Bruno being burned at the stake saying, oh, about that whole earth revolving around the sun thing, maybe we just talk about it. Or then the next one over there, I'm not a monkey's cousin, get thee behind me, I mean Satan. And then if I could travel along and deem his speed of light, Albert, stop daydreaming in class. He'll never amount to anything. And then the middle one there, Large Hadron Collider. I love this slogan. Science, if you ain't pissing people off, you ain't doing it right. <laughs> we don't have an obligation to tell you what you want to hear, only what we know. Uh, they like what science gives them, but not the question science asks. So what are the consequences of what's happening here? Okay? We're in a society now where we look at a weird world where truth no longer seems to govern what our government is about to do. Uh, we have both a secretary of education and a vice president who are creationists. Uh, we'll talk about it in a second here. Climate change insurance is going to be severely threatened. The APA is going to gut it. Rick Perry probably tried to do his best to make the Department of Energy go away. We even have anti-vaxxers by uh, being asked by Trump to examine the issue again. It's been killed by thousands of scientific studies. Uh, I'm sure uh, Jeannie will talk about Betsy DeVos, a homeschooler who leads in Christian church schools, does not believe in public education, and certainly a very hardcore creationist. She's about to become our education secretary. I love this little quote from one of these uh, backers of Trump that was on the news. Um, this is young Earth creationist uh, Scaramucci. During an interview, he argued that since people were wrong about the Earth being flat, therefore scientists can be wrong about global climate change. And here's his actual quote. I'm saying that people have gotten things wrong through the last 5,000 years history of our planet. <laughs> All right? And then Rick Perry is uh, clearly planning to, to pretty much gut the Department of Energy. Uh, and they've already had these things where they're looking for ways to identify anyone in the Department of Energy who works on climate change. And then they were scientific response to that. They defied the Department of Energy did not want to tell them what they wanted to learn. It's straight out of McCarthy's playbook, okay? Our new EPA minister, Scott Pruitt, did his whole career in Oklahoma, sorry, Seth, suing the EPA. And now he's about to run it, okay? Um, one of the scariest parts is NASA has been told already by the Transition Committee they're going to have a huge cut in their Earth science budget. All the satellites that monitor climate and so on are about to be cut. And they can't be shipped on any other agency because that's NASA's the only one that can run them. So that's like poking your eyes out just because you don't want to see climate change. All right? So what scientists are doing instead, we are worried about the future. We're copying all our data and backing it up on the good chance the government's going to try to erase it. Uh, the new Secretary of Interior, assuming he gets confused, big supporter of drilling on public lands, national parks, national forests, Bureau of Land Management. Guess where we're going on that one? Uh, the budget director actually said this a few weeks ago, we should stop funding science research in the government altogether. 
And there are a lot of Republicans in Congress who would go with that, okay? Uh, now, let's finish this by saying, okay, well, where does this lead us? Because ultimately, there is a reality check here. You can propagandize and mislead and lie, but nature is not fooled, okay? Nature will win in the long run, okay? You can, may, he may succeed in crippling our science education, our science policy, our scientific research institutions. The rest of the world, however, isn't politically crippled like we are in this respect. Uh, the Paris Accords on climate change are in effect, and we may not do much about them, but I don't think they'll get revoked. Um, his promise to bring back jobs and bring you know, prices and bring tariffs up to restrict imports, anyone in economics will tell you what tariffs do to economies. They crash them. Okay? Um, the most likely thing is, as you know, our economy is cyclical. If you go long enough in a bull market, sooner or later they call a market correction. There's a recession or at least a slight downturn. We've gone almost eight years now without one of those. Uh, any economist can tell you we're about overdue to get that recession. Of course, the one that doomed the presidencies of George W. and George H. W. Bush. So I would say to the Trump supporter, you lost too. It just hasn't hit you yet. All right? And so here's an article, Wall Street Journal, not exactly a liberal rag. When presidents defy economic gravity, gravity usually wins, right? If you try to mess with the economic cycles, if you try to change things in a way that that are not going to reflect underlying economic principles, you're just going to mess it up. Okay? Uh, the biggest area, and this is my prediction for you guys, go fill up your tank, let me get out of here. Right after Trump uh, uh, takes your oath, or within six months, I predict price of oil will rise pretty fast, and gas will get expensive again. And you say, well, why is that? Well, if you know anything about oil, and I actually worked in the oil industry briefly, and I have spent a lot of time thinking about it, it's an artificial low price system right now because the major OPEC companies, especially Saudi Arabia, have been flooding the oil market with their cheap oil. It's five bucks a gallon rather than 50 bucks a gallon like we have to make. And that's been the deliberate policy for about eight years now, not to support Obama, although it's helped him. It's to push the Russians, push the Iranians, and push us. And so what they did is they hurt the Russian economy, they hurt the Iranian economy, and all of our small oil companies have almost all gone under now. It's bad news at the oil patch right now because of that. Well, they can turn that switch really fast. OPEC already put us in two recessions in the 1970s alone. If they decide Trump is too cozy to the Russians, guess what they'll do? Now, the Russians won't mind if they raise the price, right, because Russia has the oil. But guess what it'll do to us? Yeah, get your car filled up before too long here. All right, so that's my prediction. You'll watch to see whether that happens or not. Uh, the universe is not quite as you thought it was. This is from Asimov. You better rearrange your beliefs then, because you certainly can't rearrange the universe. Another quote from Asimov, there's a cult of ignorance in the United States, and there always has been. Strange of analectualism has been constant thread winding its way through the one political and cultural life, uninjured by false notions that democracy means that my ignorance is just as good as your knowledge. Okay? Or a final couple of quotes about what happens when you deny reality from Dostoevsky. Nature doesn't ask your permission. She doesn't care about your wishes or whether you like the laws or not. You're obliged to accept it as it is, and consequently all its results as well. Uh, from Robert K. Watson, Mother Nature is just chemistry, biology, and physics. That's all she is. Cannot sweet talk her, cannot spin her, cannot tell her the oil company says climate change is a hoax. No, Mother Nature is going to do whatever chemistry, biology, and physics dictate. Mother Nature is always bats last, and she always bats the thousand. <laughs> and those of us older remember this old chiffon margarine commercial, it's not nice to fool with Mother Nature. And so I love that, the, the speech Obama gave last week. Uh, the phrase science and religion matter was very, very important, you know. A reason, excuse me, <laughs> shows you where I'm thinking. So here we were, the ultimate swift boating. We were spending all this time, and we now know the Russians are helping us, all this time being distracted by minor shit, and meanwhile, the globe keeps on overheating and the sea levels are rising. Thank you very much. Donald Prothrow, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for the good news. Sorry, it's depressing as hell, I know. Yeah, no, it's great. That's great. My goodness. My goodness. <laughs>